Good morning. Good morning. Praise the Lord. Buenos dias. Como están? Pastor Peter, um, I was greeted this morning. Um, you said Lunar New Year. Is it the same thing as the Chinese New Year? Oh, is there any food involved? Oh, because you talked about partying and fasting and, you know, this, this week I found out about a very interesting eating disorder. Um, somebody, I, was, I think my wife and I were watching this and some young person, they, people that forget to eat, you know, and, and I'm thinking to myself, how the heck do you forget to eat? Like, I've got people inside of me that remind me about eating constantly, you know, and I could never forget to eat. And it's something that I just find pretty curious, so I thought I would share that with you. I don't know if anybody has that problem, but if you do, please tell me how you deal with it, because I want to forget how to eat sometimes. And for fasting, I think I'm going to fast the gym. Is that okay, Pastor Peter? Does that count? Is that funny? It's fasting. It's something that you do. Trisha and I normally go to the gym, but if i fasting, why would I want to go to the gym? I never want to go to begin with anyway. Amen? Praise God. I have a word for us this morning, and, and thank you, Pastor Peter and Long Island Alliance Church, the Board of Elders and um, Leadership, for allowing me to minister. And thank you also for your support that you provide for um, Santiago Teen Challenge and the Dominican Republic, which is really now Dominican Republic Teen Challenge. I and mean, I guess one day I'll come and give you guys an update um, as to what's going on in the Dominican Republic and the Ministry of Teen Challenge there. Um, but it's been a blessing um, um, to be here for the past couple of years, to minister along with you and to have the friendships that we have here, and to be in family as we, as we feel that we are here with all of you. Amen? Uh, this morning I have a word, and I pray it encourages you as we get into it and come out of it. Amen? And if we can turn to the book of Isaiah chapter 40, the book of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28, we have the scriptures on the screen. Amen? Praise God. If you could stand for the reading of God's word, please. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28 says, Do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired? His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We ask in the name of Jesus that you speak to us, that you help us understand your capabilities and powers, Lord, and the strength that you have in our lives and the grace that you have for us also. Father, I pray that if there's anybody here this morning um, who, is, who feels like that they're at the end of their rope and maybe w- looking to give up, Lord, I pray that you would speak to them today. I thank you that you've spoken to me through this, Lord, and Father, I pray that the revelations that you've given me that others can have also so that their lives can be changed and that they can lean on you for everything, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. I have a subscripture, um, and it's 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says, therefore, if anybody is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And the title for my message today is God's Reset Switch for My Life. God's Reset Switch for My Life. I remember when I was growing up, um, I had a video game console called Atari. Is anybody old enough to remember the Atari video game consoles? Amen. Um, I, I got my first one when I was, I think, like 10 years old, and I had gotten it the wrong way, if you know what I'm saying. I, <laughs> my mother and my parents had money somewhere, and Ray found it, and he went and bought one, gave it to his cousin, and said, hey, you just hold on to it. His mother called my mother and said, hey. My son has a game. How did your son get it? And it became a big thing because they caught me. So anyway, everywhere my mother put money, I used to always find it and take it. And God allowed me to marry someone who does the same thing, Trish. Everywhere I put money, she finds it and takes it. Right? Right? 
So I get what I, I get, I, I reap what I sowed, amen. <laughs> I'm not going to ask anybody, does anybody else have a wife like that? <laughs> um, so do you remember those games? Um, they, they were monochromatic or black and white uh, with shapes that had only straight lines and squares. Um, many games like Tank, and I have some pictures just to remind you. Remember the Tank game? Um, they look so really different than the ones that we have today. There's another one called Breakout. Um, that's Breakout. Remember that game? And then there was another one called Pong, um, and Pong and Breakout, Pong was just two, two, two sticks at the end of the screens that you would bounce a ball back and forth with. And I spent many hours immersed in these experiences. And you guys that have, maybe you haven't played these video games, but you've played other video games probably, amen? And, and then there was a game called Space Invaders. Anybody remember Space Invaders? All right. Yeah, that's the game. That was the Mario Brothers game of the day. And, and this game, according to Wikipedia, says, it was a fixed shooter in which the player moves a laser cannon horizontally across the bottom of the screen. That green thing on the bottom is what you move left and right. Um, the aliens begin as five rows of 11 and move left to right. And every time they hit the wall or the edge of the screen, they would go down a level. The idea was to destroy all of the white things on the top, which were aliens, before they got to the bottom of the screen and crushed you. In all video games, the better you were, the longer you lived, the longer you played. If you were playing at an arcade, the game ended when your lives were all used up. However, if you were playing at home, these games or consoles had a switch called a reset or a reset button or a switch. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The little button that you just press reset on and the game starts all over. Whenever you ran out of lives, you could hit the reset switch and start all over again. Whether you were playing Call of Duty, Mario Brothers, Tetris, competing in the EVO Championship, Fortnite World Cup, League of Legends, or Dota 2 International with the whopping, you know the Dota 2 has a $34 million cash prize for those that play it. I probably should have studied playing video games and not whatever else I'm doing. <laughs> you can always find that all of the video games that they've created, whether it's on your phone or somewhere, they always have a reset switch or a restart that you can start over switch. You get a fresh, batch, a fresh batch of new lives or opportunities every time for an unlimited amount of times. So this thing just goes on forever and ever and ever. The reset button offers, two, offers the players two advantages. It's number one, you could play forever no matter how many times they killed you or you ran out of lives or time. The, most, the other most important advantage was that it allowed you to learn how to play the game. So every time you pressed reset, you came back and you had already memorized where all the bad things were, depending on the game, or where all the hidden tricks were, and you would move farther in the game because you had reset the game. As I go through life and all the challenges it can present as we go through life, I sometimes, I sometimes wonder, wouldn't it be nice if life had a reset button? For moments like when you might have gotten a bad grade in school, when you got that test back, that time when you were in a relationship that didn't go well, the phone call with bad news, the visit to the doctor's office that didn't go well. Maybe life has been overwhelmingly hard for you, and you feel like starting over would make things better. Has anybody ever felt like that? Like, man, I wish I could just start over. You know, just maybe once or twice having access to that reset button like we do on the video games. Can anyone think of a time when you would have used it? I'm sure many people have thought, wow, I wish I could just start over and get rid of all of these problems. Even God appears to have used a reset button of, store, of sorts when in the story of Noah, when the flood came, it was sort of like pressing reset, wiping out all of creation and starting all over again. Or not all of creation, all of mankind with the exception of those on the boat. Well, I have news for you. About 2,300 years after the flood, God gave the world the ultimate reset switch. It's the cross. The cross is where all things become new. The cross is where we get a new chance at life. The cross is where we go when we run out of lives. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation, creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The New Living Translation says it this way. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. The new has begun. It, when you come to Christ, you have, in essence, pressed reset. You have started life all over again with a fresh new batch of lives. 
And there it is, the life, the real life recess, which Romans 6, 4 says, Therefore, having been buried with him through the baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. When we come to the cross, we are made new. We are given a new life. We are forgiven of our sins and past as if they had never even happened. They have never even happened. God's, God's word says that he wipes them away and throws them into the sea of forgetfulness. He cannot remember what we used to do. Only we can. It's impossible for him to know what we did. In, the, in other words, remember and recall it to use it against us. Just like in video games, you learn as you go. So it is with the cross. When you come to the cross and press reset, remember and learn from your previous mistakes. Remember what it was that tripped you or made you fall. Was it that website that constantly tempts you? Is it a toxic relationship? Maybe it's none of those and bad things just keep coming your way. I mean, not everything we go through is because of something we did. Some things just happen in life and we feel like giving up because they never end. I call it the endless waves of trials. Waves of trials. And if you've ever been to the beach, the um, waves come in cycles. And there's a big wave. It rests, and then there's another wave, and you get your time to catch your breath. Sometimes in life, it feels like the wave just keeps coming and coming and coming, and you don't have enough time to recover from the previous one. One thing after the other just keeps happening to us. We get worn down, tired, and just feel like throwing in the towel and giving up. It's almost like a Job experience. One thing after the other. It just seems to never end. seems like you can't catch a break. While some trials come through self-inflicted wounds, others show up at your front door without you even expecting them. The two types of trial, there are two types of trials. And the first one are the provoked ones, which are the consequences of our sins. As an example, one of these can be stealing and getting caught and going to jail. You went to jail because you were stealing. You made a choice to do something. Therefore, there are consequences for that. That wasn't something God did, but something the person chose to do. The consequences of stealing are consequences, or the consequences of stealing are time in jail, unless you live in New York, and then they'll just let you go. You earned, you earned it by your behavior. In David's case, the consequences of committing adultery were that his son died, and other family issues. So many that, that I could be here forever telling you what happened in David's family because of his um, because of the consequences. The second types of trials are the unprovoked ones, like the ones in Job's case. These trials God allows in people's lives to disciple us and change us and make us more into the image of Christ, like an illness or a child that has gone astray or maybe even a death in the family. These are all unprovoked and just part of life. Sometimes we confuse what we feel during these trials as punishment from God. So sometimes we go through things, especially if they're unprovoked, meaning that there was something that you had nothing to do with, that you were just driving down the street, you got into an accident, your car got totaled, and you were like, you didn't run a red light, you didn't do anything, and, you, and trials just keep coming at you. These are the unprovoked ones. God allows these to come into us um, to, to tra tra train us up and transform us. But we think sometimes, because they're so frequent, these trials, that God is punishing us for something we did. Webster's Dictionary defines punishment as to cause to experience pain or suffering for having done wrong. It's what we do to others when they hurt us or do something we don't like. So we instinctively, as carnal beings, have this thing that just wants to have retribution towards another person. When somebody cuts you off on the road, what do you want to do? You want to just tap your brakes so they can flip over and, and spin out, right? I do. <laughs> I don't know if you do, but that's what I feel like doing. And that's the problem is that because, I, because when somebody talks to me a particular way and I react a particular way because of my flesh, I think and we can think that God thinks the same way. So we think that when things are happening to us is that God is punishing us because we tend to think that he thinks like we do. But remember, his ways are beyond our ways. And he thinks way differently than we do. It's what we do to others when they hurt us. So, however, when we come to understand or know God's character, we will also know that God does not punish us. So whether you stole and went to jail or something just keeps happening to you, God will not punish you in either case. Going to jail is not God punishing us if we do something wrong. Nothing he does 
or allows is for hurting us. If we repent or bow at the cross, God will use those experiences to our benefit and his glory. Remember, Christ suffered complete punishment at the cross for us. So when he went to the cross, he took everything we could have ever been punished for and got punished for himself. Therefore, nothing we do, as, 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 as far as committing an act of crime or whatever, will require punishment from God or will, will provoke God to punish us. There will be circumstances and there will be um, things that happen, the, the effects, the cause and effect, or whatever it is that happens because you got caught doing something or doing something wrong, those things are going to happen. But God does not use or allow those things because he's saying, here, I'm going to get Ray because he was just so bad, he's going he's to know what God is. He's going to know who I am now. And he puts his thumb on me and then never lets it go. Some people feel that that's the way it is sometimes because that's the way it feels, because that's the way we're used to treating others. The Bible says in Romans 8.28, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. He causes all things to work together for good. So it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how bad you've been. It doesn't matter what type of sin you've committed. It doesn't matter how bad you spoke to somebody. If you've repented, if you have a contrite heart, and you've come to the Lord and said, Lord, I'm sorry for doing that, you might have consequences to it, but it's all going to work out for your good and for God's glory. When we sin and repent, God sees our contrite heart and turns that situation around for us. So even if it was our own doing, when we turn to Christ and ask for forgiveness, we have, in effect, pressed the reset switch on the video game. God will use the consequences left over from our sin to shape us and make us more like Christ. Our problem is that we sometimes think that God behaves like we do. There's a word, a German word, called schadenfreude, I don't know if I'm saying it right because I have no German in me. Um, it's the experience of pleasure or joy or self-satisfaction that comes from learning or witnessing the troubles or failure and humiliation of others. It's that feeling that we get as humans when somebody else, when you see somebody else hurting after they did something to you. We think that God is getting even for us, and that's wrong because that doesn't happen because God is not that kind of a, of a being that will hurt somebody else just so that we can feel better. And anybody understand what I'm saying? It feels that way, and we think that God is sticking up for us and doing something, but man, if, it, if, we, if we truly understand the character of God, we will know that he is not doing something to hurt that person. What we say, this is what we say when we say they got what they deserved, and from, the perspective, and from, from that perspective is where we think that God judges. Does anyone know what this is? And this is called a... One up mushroom. I think we have an image of that. Amen? It's called the one up mushroom. Has anybody seen this before? If you played Mario Brothers, you should know what this is. It's, a, it's hidden in all Super Mario Brothers games. Well, it gives players an extra life when you find this little thing. This feature is the rarest upgrade in the Mario Brothers series. It's one of the hardest things to get because of how complicated it is to get all the coins from the previous levels, and it requires risking your life to get it. So when you find this thing, you get an extra life. God in his mercy left us the ultimate one-up mushroom. And I should have had an image of the cross here, and I didn't put it up. But God left us what? The Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is our one-up mushroom. Amen? When we have the Holy Spirit, in Acts 1.8 it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witness in both Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and as far as the remotest parts of the earth. This is where we level up in this thing called life. If you remember, the video games also have a feature for people who play well and reach a certain level in the game. They call it the power up button. If you've played video games, you find that you grab all these little things, and sometimes because you've grabbed so many of them, you get special weapons, or because you made it through a certain alley, they give you something else, and you have all this stash of weapons back here, and what you do is you go to them when you need them because you're going to need those types of weapons to continue to advance and move forward in the game. The power-ups are special ability, abilities. They help you to run faster. They help you to defeat different enemies. And you can run longer, and you can enter new worlds and dimensions with these features. Power-ups are special abilities Mario gets, usually by collecting or touching objects during his adventures. You see, the Holy Spirit is our power-up button. 
He gives us hope and peace during difficult times. He convicts us when we don't, he convicts us so that we don't go in the wrong direction. He helps us pray when we are weak. He gives us wisdom for making decisions. He gives us confidence over fear. He gives us spiritual gifts. Without the Holy Spirit, we would be dead in our tracks. It is necessary. It is a necessary component in our lives for us to get to the next level in our walk with God. We think that by trying harder, we will get a better life, better at life. We do so many things in our own strength, and before we know it, we are being defeated, growing tired, and sometimes even feel like quitting. Sometimes using the wrong strategy for our fights. We're so used to fighting with our flesh, thinking that we're smarter and that we're older, and because we're older that we know better, and we know better than somebody else, that's what we know how to take care of things in our own way. We think that, the fight, that we're fighting a horizontal battle, and you've heard this before, we're not fighting a battle that's, that's facing us, we're fighting a battle that's coming from around us and above us. That's why we can't fight face to face. You can't show up to a gun battle with a knife. We always used to say that. If you're going to go somewhere and you're going to get into a fight, make sure that you have appropriate weapons for what you're going to be doing. Ephesians chapter 6, 12 says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This is where we need to learn how to start fighting. This is why we're fasting or we're going to fast, because we need special weapons for this fast. You cannot move to the next level without obtaining these special weapons. I'm speaking this way so that we can understand maybe what, 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 I'm, what I'm referring to because it's not something that's like, oh, maybe I'll get it, maybe no. No, if you fast and you pray and you stay in God's word, you will find that you will obtain better resources to fight your spiritual battles. Sometimes we can't even see what's coming at us. How, how then can we expect to put up a good fight without the proper resources. And you might ask me, where can I find those weapons? Where are they hidden in the game of this thing we call life? Resources and special gear for the spiritual battle. Um, I'm glad you asked because if you've played video games, you always know that you get together with your friends and your friends give you strategies and your friends tell you, hey, if you take this guy and you drop him here and you do something else after that, it's going to give you more points or more coins or more lives. And, and you're always exchanging strategies on how to extend your life within the game. And I'm sure that the young kids here know what I'm talking about. You meet online somewhere and you're just, you're just telling people how to defeat the game, how to, the, the, how to trick the game even. Amen? So here is my strategy on how to trick the game. It's found in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 and 18. It's therefore put on the full armor of God. This is what you need to do to be able to get to the next level in this game. Amen. This is what you do to be, to be able to defeat the enemy when he's coming at you, when you're caught blindsided, when you wake up and out of nowhere this problem is at you with, that you didn't even anticipate. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. In other words, stay standing. Don't give up. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. That's the first weapon. With the breastplate of righteousness in place. That's the second one and with your feet fitted with readiness that comes with the gospel of peace. That's the other one, the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, another weapon, which you, with, with which you can extinguish all the evil arrows that come from the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, another one, and the sword of the Spirit, another one, which is the word of God. So what is it? The sword of the Spirit. That's your weapon. It's the only weapon found within the armor that is counter, that's for counterattacks. It's the one that you use to fight with. The Word of God. This is why today's um, teaching or sermon, whatever we want to call it, is, has so many scriptures in it. Because the Word is what helps us defeat the enemy. It's the Word of God that gives us the weapon that we need to be able to fight. And verse 18 says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert, and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. In other words, let's pray for each other. We constantly do that on Tuesday night, on on Wednesday nights uh, at 8 o'clock, we constantly come together in our prayer, in our video prayer room, and we pray for each other. There are people in here that you don't even know you're being prayed for. You're being mentioned by name in prayer for things that are going on in your life. We are interceding. We are doing the spiritual part in the background. And not that we're better because we ask you to join us. You can do this also because you can pray for me. I need all the prayer I can get. 
But we pray and we intercede and we fight for you and help you and lift you up and gird you up. I don't know what any of you are going through today or during this season of your life, but I want you to know that we can all press reset or start over when we all come to the cross. If you think it's not powerful enough, think of all the things the cross can do for you. It raises the dead, it heals the sick, it delivers from evil, it gives us hope, it left us the Holy Spirit, and most importantly, it gives us eternal life. Yes, the ultimate icon in the video game is the unlimited lives button. The cross did that for us. Through the cross, we have unlimited abilities. Unlimited abilities. God gives us so much power through the cross to the extent that even when we die, we are born again in the Spirit to live on forever. It's, it's, it's our promise. It's our thing. And we don't have to learn how to do this, man. It's so simple. Accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in your heart. Confess that you're a sinner in need of a Savior and confess Him as Lord, and you will be saved. That means that you will enjoy the benefits of the power up button of the cross. You will have that thing on you, and you will be able to get through anything in life. This is what the cross can do. I don't know what problems you've had. I don't know what difficulties you're facing in life. My, my family and I, last year was a very difficult year for us, extremely difficult for us. But it was the cross that kept us. It was God's word. It was sitting down and just repeating the promises of God repeating them to myself, because sometimes I doubt. And when I doubt, I have to go to the Word and remind myself, no, this is what God's Word says. If it says this, then I just have to believe it. I might not feel good at the time, but it's what sustains me and keeps me. Sometimes we limit the power of the cross because of our fleshly expectations and what we think it, it can do or can do. Remember the songs we, we started out worshiping with today? It was all about the power of God the creator of heaven and earth. We're talking, about, we're talking about the being, I was going to say the guy, the man, that created something out of nothing. Everything in this room was created out of something that already existed. The carpet it probably has petroleum-based products in it that were mined out of the earth that had to be processed and turned into whatever it is. God created all of this out of nothing. He just said it and it was there. That's the kind of God we have, that no matter what you're going through in life, no matter how much you're hurting, no matter how much it feels like, it, like you can't bear it or take it on anymore, God wants to tell you that he already did it for you. And we have to believe in the power and the strength that God has to bring healing to us. We cannot limit him because he is not like we are. We are extremely limited. limited. God is not limited. And I want to give you an example of someone who pressed reset at the cross with their lives, who we would think is beyond being, a, being able to be helped. In June, on June 1st, 1953, a boy named by the name of Richard David Falco was born in Brooklyn, New York. Within a few days of being born, his mother gave him away. He was adopted by a Jewish American couple from the Bronx who were childless. Richard had a troubled young life, getting in trouble with larceny and setting things on fire. His adoptive mother died of breast cancer when he was 14. Troubles continued as he didn't like the women his adoptive father married, so he joined the army. He later looked into who his biological mother was, and forensic anthropologist Elliot Layton described this discovery of his birth details as the primary crisis in his life. This was a primary point in his life where the enemy came in and just took hold of him. It described um, the primary crisis in his life where he was able to not identify with anything. It shattered his sense of identity. During the mid-1970s, Richard started to commit violent crimes. New York City was terrorized and full of fear during the 70s because of what this man was doing. He killed six people and, 11, and, and injured 11 others using a 44 caliber gun, earning him the name the 44 caliber killer. And if you were around in the 70s, you would know who I'm talking about. He is better known as the son of Sam, David Berkowitz. Sam was the dog that he had, and David claimed that the dog was telling him to kill people. On May 8, 1978, he pleaded guilty to six murders and was given six sentences of 25 years to life. In other words, there's no hope for parole for this man. He's in jail for the rest of his life, of his natural life. You would think that after all the killings and the amount of people hurt by these tragedies, that David Berkowitz would be beyond redemption. But no. After serving 10 years in prison, 
of his prison sentence, one night David was walking the prison yard, and another inmate came up to him and introduced himself, and he said, listen, I know you're David Berkowitz, and I want to tell you something. I want you to know that Jesus Christ loves you, and he's, not, and he's got a plan for, and purpose for your life. And David said, listen, I don't want to hear that, because you know I've done too many evil things, and there's no forgiveness for me. Maybe there's a God out there someplace, but I don't think he has any interest in me at all. The man says, no, David, you're wrong. David, God, David, God has sent me here to prison just to tell you that he loves you and he can forgive you. This man started to share Christ with David Berkowitz, and within a couple of months' time, David Berkowitz accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I can tell you it has been a true transformation as I personally know someone who works with David Berkowitz. He's in prison. They write books together. Um, and, and this is a, a powerful testimony of someone who we, in our natural eyes, would think is beyond redemption. We would think that there's, this guy did way too much stuff. I, we know, or I know, some of you might know of a person who works with people that have been convicted of sexual crimes. God still loves those people. They haven't gone beyond the love of God because God is powerful in all ways. So if God can redeem David Berkowitz, if God can redeem people who have committed horrendous crimes, if God can redeem me, a drug addict from the streets of New York, and, and use me in any way he wants to, then God can redeem you. And my consequences, I have consequences for the things that I did. There was the separation of family. There's so many things I could go down the list of them. But God used every single one of those things to change me into a better person. So I don't know what you've done. I don't know how many times you've denied God. I don't know what you're going through in life. Maybe it's unprovoked. Maybe life just seems to be hard on you right now. I want to let you know that God is above anything you're going through, whether it's a sickness, whether it's a disease, whether it's someone in your family you love that's, that's, that's out on the streets. Man, it's, it's difficult as a parent to have a child who, who does not know Jesus and who's serving the world. It's a very difficult thing to wake up in the morning and know that your son and your daughter is, 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 is not well with God and that if they die today, they're going to spend eternity in hell. It is not a, a good thing to experience because you love your children, and some people are going through that. Some people have family members that don't know the Lord. I don't know if you're having issues in school or maybe issues at work. They seem to be unending. I want to encourage us today that it's not too difficult for God that if you just hold on to the cross, and I'm going to ask the worship team to come up, that if you just hold on to the cross, if you just bow down before him, and you just say, Lord, I need your help because I can't carry this any longer. I can't do this. I have, I, I have to do that daily because when I think that I am capable of doing it, I fall flat on my face. So my encouragement to all of us here today is I'm not minimizing the trial that you might be in. I am in no way, shape, or form minimizing it. I, I have empathy, and, I, and, I, and I'm with you, and I will pray for you. But don't think that God is punishing you. Don't think that for a minute, because God loves you. God really, really loves you. I thought for a long time God was punishing me because of what I did to my parents, what I did to my family, what I did to my children, all the nights, all the days, all the things I did on the streets of New York. I, I, I lived with that guilt for a long time. My wife and I both have similar experiences in our growing up and, and thought that, my goodness, this is just God putting his foot on my neck and getting even with me. And it's difficult to have a loving relationship with your creator when you feel that way because you feel like you're constantly being punished. But God's not punishing us. God loves us. Yeah, the pain is there, but God wants you to know that he's with you in your pain. And if you just come to the cross humbly and embrace him, you will feel how he will help you and how he will allow you to have peace and how you will call him Abba Father and how you will know how good of a God he is. And if you have any doubts, continue to read his word. Learn the promises of God. Memorize scripture so that when the enemy comes and tells you, you're no good, 
You're never going to amount to anything. That's what I was told all my life when I was growing up. You're no good. You're never going to amount to anything. You're this, you're that, you're this, that, and the other thing. Those words just kept going at my soul, going at my soul. The devil just kept repeating them to me even after I came to the Lord. Keeps repeating them that you're no good, you're no good. Look at what you did. Look at what you did. Look at what you looked on the computer. Look at what you read in that book. Look at how you looked at that girl. Look at how you looked at that guy. It's a constant attack. We think God is doing that. God does not treat us like that. God says, come, just like you are. He wants to embrace you, and he wants to heal you, and he wants to comfort you. Let's stand and worship the Lord together.